Welcome back. My name is Chris. And I'm Steve. And this is Streaming Things. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Today, we're covering on Hump Day, uh, a very special patron-demanded episode. It's Confessions of a Dangerous Mind from 2002, demanded by Emmy. So, fuck. (laughs) Let's start over. (laughs) I crushed it, too, other than that. You were doing so great. Welcome back. My name is Chris. And I'm Steve. And this is Streaming Things. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hump day. Happy hump day. Mike, 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 Mike. Remember that camel? <laughs> who who can forget that camel? <laughs> Mike, 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 Mike. That was like meme city domination for a year, that fucking camel. Facebook loved that camel. <laughs> Remember when Facebook was cool? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Before the boomers took it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This time we're talking about Confessions of a Dangerous Mind from 2002, a movie mandated by one of our patrons, Ghost. Ghost. We do that once a week, every Wednesday, baby. We're doing these patron-demanded movies. Uh, Next week is A a Night of the Opera. Yeah, from Emmy. From Emmy. So that'll be interesting. That movie's from 1935. Yeah, I don't think I've seen that. Yeah. Uh, Nor had I seen Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Really? You've never seen this before? I hadn't. I had not either. George Clooney's directorial debut. What was funny about this, Steve, is because you told me we were covering Confessions of a Dangerous Mind (laughs) for months. And for months, in my mind, we were going to watch... Dangerous Minds, starring Michelle Pfeiffer, about uh, an ex-Marine who goes to teach as a substitute teacher in an inner city school. And I thought that's what we were watching. And I was actually hyped for it because I used to love, this is like a whole genre. There was versions of these called The Substitute, I think, with Tom Berenger. I watched all of them as a kid. And I was like, ah, oh, cool. We're going to watch so I'm trying to explain to you what Confessions of a Dangerous Mind is on the way home from me watching um, an early screening of The Flash a couple of days ago. And I'm trying I'm like, yeah, they go to the school and you're like, oh, neat. And then at some point in the middle of me telling you this, I'm like, wait a second. I don't think that's what this is. Or no, you were like reading the cast to me or something. Yeah, because you were like, oh, Tom Berenger's in it. And I'm like, I don't think he is. I think it's Sam Rockwell. And you're like, no, Sam Rockwell's not in that. It was wild. <laughs> So anyway, that's dumb. I thought we were watching Dangerous Minds with Michelle Pfeiffer. We're not. No. Uh, this movie stars Sam Rockwell. Uh, it's got uh, George, George Clooney, Clooney, Drew Barrymore, Julia Roberts. Uh, I was like, wow, what is this? Oh, right? Rutger Hauer. Rutger Hauer, but even more amazing, uh, like an eight-year-old Michael, Michael Sarah, <laughs> with like the worst first line, like of dialogue for any child actor ever. Yes. Uh, in one of the, maybe the most off-putting scene I've seen all year. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's up there. A couple things in this movie. Um, so neither of us had ever seen this before. Again, it's George Clooney's directorial debut uh, based on a book written by the real Chuck Barris. This movie is fascinating. I'd never heard of any of this shit because mm-hmm. I'm a dumb dumb. Uh, like, but co-written by the legendary screenwriter, probably one of the best to ever do it, Charlie Kaufman, who wrote Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, uh, Synecdoche, New York, all kinds of good stuff. So I was like, wow, what the fuck is this? Uh, he apparently hates this movie because George Clooney took the script in wildly different directions. Chuck uh, no, Charlie Kaufman. Oh, OK. Gotcha. Yeah. Chuck Chuck Barris. Why does Charlie hate it? Because George Clooney just made it his own thing. He did. Uh, he took a lot of the stuff, uh, took liberties with the script, massive liberties. And uh, he told Charlie, look, I'm sorry, man, but at no, no studio would have greenlit the ideas that you had. Uh, what were some of the ideas, do you know? He's a very surreal. If you've seen Synecdoche, New York or, or Eternal Sunshine or any of those movies, it's, yeah. they're very s- full of surrealism. And mm-hmm. some of that's in this movie for sure still, like the dream sequences and things like that, like the yeah. visions of his mother. Um <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, so I can imagine it was wild, but I don't agree that the studio wouldn't greenlight it because he's had some Oscar winning scripts that are weird as shit uh, yeah. other than this. But uh, he did. Um, what's that movie with uh, being John Malkovich? Like Charlie Kaufman's weird. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But he's but he's he's smart. He's good at what he does. Uh, but yeah, this was fun. This was fun. Like uh, the whole idea that this uh, vapid TV show creator slash host uh, wrote a book in 1984 saying he was also a secret spy who killed 33 people for the CIA. Um, and then later, so the CIA d- disavowed him. <laughs> they said, he's never worked for us. That's all bullshit. And then later on, he said, yeah, I made it all up. And then in 2010, Chuck Barris was interviewed and they were like, so did you kill people for the CIA or not? And he said, I'll never tell. 
Yeah. Right. So it's still kind of out there whether or not you think he was really a CIA secret spy. Yeah. He, 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 before he passed, he passed away in 2017. I yeah. Think, 20, at uh, like 83 Christmas. years old. Yeah. He was up there. Uh, but yeah, his, his modern day saying was like, I'll neither confirm nor deny that type of thing. Yeah. He's like, I don't even tell my wife. He wrote a follow-up book uh, as well. Yeah, it's like the grass, something about grass. Yeah, something about Some, grass. Something about grass, daddy. It's always greener. Um, but yeah, so on paper, it is such a fascinating concept. Like by day, network TV producer who creates hit TV shows. By night, CIA assassin. Yeah. Using using the, the cover of what he can do travel-wise for his TV shows. Uh, to do be a hitman for the CIA, like it's that's a really really cool concept and a really fun idea. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think the movie is interesting. I, I don't think it's a home run, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I think that they take interesting tacks with it because they obviously, on the one hand, they seem to go with the line of reasoning that he was a spy and this is what it would have been like. But I think they leave room to doubt to paint his life in such a sad way. Like he's like the whole first half of this movie, he's like this uh, borderline or overtly like uh, abusive. I would say overtly. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Incel who has such a sad existence and and notion of his own self-importance that he would make this kind of thing up. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but then they let it play out like he was a spy at the same time. So they kind of try to have it both ways. I kind of enjoy that about the movie. Uh, I love Sam Rockwell. I think he's one of the most underappreciated actors working today. He's really good in this role. Like he's such a, he's very good at playing people who are damaged, can be sleazy. Smarmy, yeah. But they're affable at the same time. Yes. You can understand this charm that people gravitate towards. Uh, He's very good at these type of roles. Have you seen Duncan Jones Moon? You have, right? Oh, I love Moon. Yeah. Yeah. Like Sam Rockwell's a gem. So good. Absolute gem. Um, and then I love all the Clooneyisms of this, like the the inclusion of, uh, like the cameo with Brad Pitt and Matt, Matt Damon. Damon. Was, they, that was really funny. They did that for free. Um, did they really? Yeah. And Julia Roberts agreed to a, a, a scaled rate of two hundred and fifty grand to be in this movie because she's friends with George Clooney. Like it was all so everybody kind of did this as a favor to George. I wish I had a friendship. Uh, and I was successful enough to where my family and friends discount rate was two hundred thousand. Yeah, I'll do it for two. F- <laughs> well, I think because you're my buddy, I'll do it for a solid, a solid two hundred k. I think that's the. <laughs> I think that's the guild minimum. Oh, okay. Like she's not allowed to charge less than that. Uh, I'm okay. pretty sure. Um, and but the cameo that you can do those for free with Matt and Brad. Um, but yeah, just, uh, there's a lot of fun stuff in this movie, mostly because Sam Rockwell's so fun. Drew Barrymore, love her. She is. She's She's fucking great great in this movie with her like kind of kooky. I don't know if this, I don't know if the role, so she plays Penny. I don't think that role would be nearly as lovable and you would feel you would have that connection with that character as much as you do if it was played by anybody other than Drew Barrymore, because she's so good at just being like this pure hearted soul, like pure hearted, but like Free spirit. You yeah. know what I mean? Pure hearted free spirit is the perfect way to describe yeah. her. Yeah. Like, do you want a ball? Like, you know, <laughs> and coming from Drew Barrymore, it's like, well, yes, but also <laughs> how sweet of you to ask. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. So it's interesting. I didn't know anything about this story. The real Dick Clark playing himself in this movie. Um, yeah, they do a couple of interesting things in this movie where they they cut to interviews of the actual people who knew uh, Chuck Barris. Yeah. And they do a weird thing where they like wash out the colors in the interviews, but like keep like the pinks. Uh, it's kind of, it's a very strange effect they're doing with the interview portion, but it's, it, it cues the audience to kind of separate like, okay, these are the real people talking about the story you're watching. Yeah. Yeah. The di- I think the direction is strong from George Clooney in this movie. Um, there's a lot of like noir aspects to a lot of the spy stuff that are shot really well. I like the way it's, there's, uh, there's one thing that bothered the shit out of me that I'll get to in a second. Um, but a lot of the directorial choices are very strong. Um, there's some incredible camera work and set uh, staging happening in this movie. Yeah. Like just absolutely, there's a couple wonders that they're showing passages of time, but it's done in one take. But like Sam Rockwell will go off screen, but when he comes back, he's in a different outfit. Or And that well, was all in one take. They, yeah. uh, they had everybody running around to mm-hmm. get into position. Or the, the scene where he's on the phone in front of his fireplace, they like pull the wall away. And so when he walks back, the wall is gone and you can see the, the, the person he's talking to on the phone, 
uh, in the at, at his desk. So it's it creates almost this split screen effect, but it's actually a practical in camera set move. Yeah, and I thought that was stuff like that is really clever, but also speaks to the design of his profession of being this like live studio audience type world that he lives in. Yeah, I mean, very soon after this, went on to become a, an Oscar winning director. I think with Good Night and Good Luck. Pretty sure. Oh, I forgot. Um, good night, good luck. Very successful, uh, even in the director's chair, that that Clooney. Um, but there were like a dozen montages in this movie. Mm-hmm. The man was obsessed with montage, and it started to kind of grate on me a little bit. I was like, there's another montage. Holy shit. It was a little hard to take notes for this movie at times because of the montages, because they're just throwing all this information at you. So it's a little yeah. hard to kind of keep up with like, uh, this I, is happening in this. Is this important? I don't know. Yeah. I think we could have gotten less of his, like, well, let's just dive in as best we can and we'll pull out things to talk about. We might not be able to do this in our normal style full on, but you're right. Like the main gist is that the movie takes the tack that he was a spy, but was he? Which is clever. And it's intercut with all of these real interviews uh, that sometimes support the fact that he was a spy and sometimes don't and sometimes attack his character just to be clear about who he was as a person. The one guy in particular was like, he was gone for weeks at a time, never knew where he was. I don't know. I don't know. So before we get into this, I need to say something that I thought was really, really funny. Sure. So I, I find the movie on Apple TV. I'm about to hit rent, you know? Yeah. And you've got the synopsis right there. And mm-hmm. it reads a synopsis and it it mentions George Clooney, Drew Barrymore, and Sam Rockwell in that order as it's going through the, the, the list, right? So it does what most synopses do. It'll name the actor and then in parentheses, maybe a movie you might have seen them from. Okay. I thought this list of films you might have seen these people in before was fascinating. I'm going to read Drew Barrymore's last because that is the one I'm like, fuck whoever wrote this. Okay. <laughs> okay. So George Clooney, Ocean's Eleven. Makes sense, right? Sure. Uh, Sam Rockwell, The Green Mile. Sure. Interesting choice, but sure. He was, Well, that's probably the most popular film he happened to be in, I would say. The great, at like, that time, like maybe. Like box office wise? At that time, maybe, sure. Well, I mean, even now. I don't know. I, when I think of Sam Rockwell, well, you, I, I don't think of... You're sitting on a microphone talking about movies. I'm talking about Joe Schmo on the street. What have you seen Sam Rockwell in? What are you going to say? Man Seven two. Psychopaths? <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> um, Drew Barrymore. Mm-hmm. Charlie's Angels. Full throttle. <laughs> the second the Charlie's second one. Angels. The one that sucks, <laughs> but everybody loves. Of all the movies that... Drew Barrymore, the queen herself. What are you going to put? Firestarter? What are you going to put? 50 e. First Dates? Firestarter? 50 First Dates? I don't know. All of those are better than Charlie's Angels. Charlie's Angels, Angels 1? Thr- yeah. Charlie's Angels 1 makes way more sense because they have to type out more words for full throttle. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the rules are for this. <laughs> uh, sorry. Just I just thought that was kind of a bewildering thing that I was I was kind of hung up on. I'm like, what? Why? <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> Never been kissed? Uh, I was trying to think of more Drew Barrymore movies. She was queen of the 90s. Uh, Yeah, good point, good point. But yeah, this came out in 2002. It opens with Dick Clark himself and Reagan being sworn in. And uh, by the way, we got almost as many shots of Sam Rockwell's perfect ass as we did montages in this movie. You His know, cheeks I, I, are I a lot. I appreciated how naked Sam Rockwell was. I didn't hate it. I, I remember it. That part where he's in the fridge, I was like, dude, it's built. Well, mm-hmm. I'm feeling things. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause I like Drew Barrymore, but right at this moment, I'm leaning I'm Sam Rockwell. <laughs> yeah. Those, I get why they're in the fridge. You got to keep them fresh. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this, this film is set. There's a title card that says this film is taken from Mr. Barris's private journals, the book that he published and real interviews. Right. And Drew Barrymore comes uh, to take, so we're in the present day, and the whole narrative framing of this is is Chuck Barris writing his memoir. Uh, is basically this narrative framing of this of this movie, and he's uh, Drew Barrymore as Penny shows up to take Chuck back to California. When are we going to get married? He won't come out or let her in. He's holed up in a New York hotel writing his memoir, butt ass naked as usual. But so, he's also got like a castaway beard and thing going on. I was listening to an interview with the real Chuck Barris, and he said that he he went to this hotel, checked into a room for two weeks, planning on he was going to write his memoir. And he said he ended up just living in that hotel for close to two years. Oh, really? Writing it. Uh, yeah. 
which is kind of fascinating. I will say, like, I was doing some research into him because I don't know the real life Chuck Barris that much. Like, I was never really into those type of like game shows that he that he popularized, like the Gong Show, the Newlywed Game, the Dating Game, all that stuff. So I did a little research on him before we recorded, and it was like 15 minutes worth before you actually showed up because I literally just finished watching this movie like a half hour before you came over. Um, and Penny seems to be a completely made up character because mm-hmm. um, he had like yeah, his, his he had multiple wives, but none of which wives. were named Penny. Yeah, I noticed that too. It's just kind of interesting because that was she's like such an integral part of this movie that humanizes him. I think they wanted to make um, a representation of like what he really probably sought out of life that he didn't get mm-hmm. and why he would make something up like being in the CIA, I guess. Yeah. Because, um, again, he later recanted that and said, I actually applied for the CIA, didn't get in uh, and became a TV show game show maker and thought, wouldn't it, would it be weird if I did both? Yeah. Um, but then he kind of left things hazy again later on in life. Uh, but yeah, so she leaves. We get a, a noir voiceover, uh, and then we, <sighs> Michael fucking Sarah, uh, <laughs> and basically starting a montage, the first montage this time of his failures and getting laid and becoming a creepy incel. Because sometimes he's like legitimately ask a girl out and gets denied, and everyone around him is always making out in the movie theater in these scenes, mm-hmm. and he can't get any. But it's, like, there's one where he just like pulls his dick out, and the lady starts crying and leaves. And I'm like, this is awful. Yeah, I don't the, like this protagonist at all. Yeah, the Michael, the Michael Sarah Sarah bit like was really un- uncomfortable for me because it's like him as like a ten year old propositioning an eight year old girl, like you want to lick it, like, and it was just like ew. And he's, he says like it tastes like strawberry, and so fucking uncomfortable. Yeah. And towards the end of the end of that scene, I'm like grossed out, like, ew, this is so weird. Why is this in here? My mind realized it was Michael Sarah. Yeah. And then I laughed. <laughs> I, I thought of him and this is the end with the Capri Suns. Yeah. So like Michael Sarah's career kind of bookends, right? He starts off as this gross <laughs> 10 year old and he ends as the this is the end, Michael Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. That's I don't know what he's been in since then, actually. I can't think of anything. Um Lego Batman movie. But it cuts to him. I guess he got a job like giving tours at He's a ABC, ABC Studios. Page. Oh, yeah. Page. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, and we we hear somebody introduce Rosemary Clooney or something, right? Which is interesting because George is the one directing it. Yeah. I always forget that he's like a mega Nepo baby. Uh, he's like oh, the, yeah. the king of Nepo babies, but yeah. I always forget because he's a really talented guy. He's a Nepo king. Uh, it's like his grandpa, his dad, everybody was in show business. Um, and then we overhear or, 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 uh, Chuck overhears women talking about what they want. So he's like, Oh, that's what I need management. Right. So he applies to be a manager so he can have sex. He finally gets sex as a management trainee. Uh, <laughs> that is kind of, that was kind of funny where he's having sex with that woman. He's like, I'm having sex with Chuck Barris management trainee. Yeah. He's she's like, like cowgirling like, Oh yeah, you're going to manage so good. Uh, and then we cut to him telling her he got fired and she tells him she's pregnant uh, and then there's like this weird, it cuts back and forth between him being shitty to her and him being shitty to a rando at the bar. Um, and he's telling her, why'd you get pregnant? <laughs> and uh, and he's telling the guy how he wanted to skip town uh, as soon as he found out because he's got important things to do. So he's a selfish prick, right? And he likes to quote Carlisle. He does. Uh, and she she wasn't really pregnant and he got punched at the bar. And now he's alone again. Cut to one of the interviews. And then it's 1961. Um, he, he's become a minor executive at ABC, a minor suit, he says, and he hangs out at amusement parks to meet young girls. Gross. Uh, and that's where he got inspired to write songs. He sold one of his songs, which is a real thing that he did to, pa- yeah. Palisade park. Yeah. It's a pretty good song. Is it? Yeah. No, nope. it's, it's one of those like songs at the time, like Palisade park. Like it's that, that very doo woppy type yeah. thing, but it's, it's, it is a bop. It's I not, get why it was a uh, number three, three in the charts. Uh, we see uh, a Maggie Gyllenhaal briefly. Yeah, my note is he hits on Maggie Gyllenhaal. <laughs> Somehow has sex with Debbie and she's bored the whole time. Uh, she's just laying there. Yeah, I don't understand. I want to know how the plot, plot uh, yeah, point he, he, A he goes where from he hits mansplaining, on her. Mansplaining pilots. And she's clearly like annoyed with him. I work in TV. To to the next cut where he's having sex with her and she's clearly just like, ugh, get this over with. I'm so over this. Yeah. I don't know what happened in between there, <laughs> but that's how he met Penny because he's naked in the fridge and that's her roommate. Yeah. Uh, and, she, and I will say, I'm going to be completely honest. This might be brutally honest. Uh-huh. This first, maybe what, five, 10 minutes of this movie that we've gone through so far. 
I was kind of hating. I was like, this is weird and gross. I don't like this dude. Well, yeah, all the way from the Michael Sarah stuff up to this yikes conversation that Penny has with him about how she likes to like fuck everybody from different nationalities. Yeah. You know, uh, I can understand you being like, okay, where is this going? Yeah. It kind of takes away from that for the rest of the time, luckily. Yeah, luckily, I think this meeting with Debbie, or not Debbie, I'm sorry, Penny, this meeting with Penny, it does have that yikes moment but the interplay between them is really good. Yeah. And they you want have, a ball? The, you want a ball? <laughs> like they have a chemistry and they seem like, what oh. if the next scene was them playing one on one in a court? <laughs> Shooting hoops. <laughs> oh, dibs on skins. I can't ball right now. I'm, I'm with <laughs> Debbie. Oh, that's true. That's true. She hates balling. <laughs> I dunk on her every time. She hates it. Uh, this, this scene was the first one. I'm like, okay, I enjoyed that scene because. I could feel Drew the Barrymore chemistry. saved the movie. She literally waltzed in and saved the movie right there because what? you're right. From then on, from that point on, the movie's very different. Yeah, for the most. Yeah, yeah. There's it's, like it's no very, longer, there's very little sexual assault or racism. Just it very. It's kept to a minimum, <laughs> which is good. Which is always Jesus. good. What are we saying? Uh, <laughs> and then. Uh, Cats and chicks was my next note because that's what that's how Penny talks. Uh, like you know, she's kind of a polyamorous, free spirited person. Like yeah, we don't want to like hold each other down or anything. Like she you don't loves wanna, love. You don't want to get a cat to get too close, right? Um, and then it, he, it cuts to them. They're banging in the shower, and then there's another fucking montage. This time it's with they're Penny. Dating. It's them dating. They're banging with Groucho Marx's noses. He's finally making out at a movie, but this time he's the only one making out. They're the only one. No yeah. one else is right. Yeah. Um, was it a thing? I, I was kind of reminded watching this. Like I remember, I remember as a little kid going to movie theaters and never seeing people make out. But no. then when I was a teenager, there was like, oh yeah, people go to the movies to make out. And I was kind of like, well, that's never happened to me. Am I doing it wrong? Am I a am I a bad teenager? Like, wow, well, does this not happen? And then when I worked at the movie theaters, I did have to bust up a bunch of people making out and giving blowjobs and stuff in the theaters. So what a, like, what a cock box, Steve. Wow. Just doing my job. I don't like it. There's actually okay. So there, there was one time where I, <laughs> I got called. I was a manager. The usher called me down because she was uncomfortable with breaking up. She's like, "There's kids making out up there," and this is like, do you remember that Matt Damon movie? Where, I forget the name of it, but it was like an old person. Like only old people would go see this Matt Damon movie, and there were only old people there. But in the top row, there was these there was these young kids who just bought a ticket to go into a dark room and make out. Right? Sure. So I went up there to bust them. What Matt Damon movie? And I'm s that's like Hereafter or something. I don't even know. Uh, I'm slowly walking up to them. They don't realize I'm standing right next to them. So they're in it. Like they're in it. So I'm literally standing there awkwardly. I look at the usher like, oh, like what do I? What do oh, I you do? brought her with you? Well, she's like kind of at the end of the stairs. Yeah. So I'm like looking down at her like, oh. and and so then I'm just like, fuck it. So I sit down next to them to see if they would like stop and they still keep going. So finally I'm like, well shit, now I'm in the more awkward position where I'm sitting next to them. <laughs> yeah. And so then finally I just go, you didn't think that through. So finally I just go, Hey, what are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> Dude freaked out so much. He fell on the floor. <laughs> wow. Like, <laughs> like, <"God!"> like, <laughs> like, a, like a movie. Yeah, and I was like, I, hey, sorry, but you guys can't do that or I'll have to ask you to leave. I'm like, okay, sorry. And I leave and then they left. Cause yeah, that's the, yeah. The, the, the whole reason up. we're here. The jig is up. I don't want to watch this fucking movie. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. No, I never made out in movie theaters either. Okay. You know, I dated one girl from, like, I had I had one girlfriend for like six months, and then she broke up with me when I caught my head on fire, and then <laughs> I was with the next woman, for, the next girl for four years until college, and uh, we just stayed at my house, and you know, <laughs> yeah. But I, when I went to movie theaters, it was w with a bunch. Yeah, you're of, watching a movie. It was, well, yeah, yes. First off, sacred place. Mm -hmm. I was with a bunch of people. Typically, it was like a group of things. You know, we'd hacky sack outside and go play, go to the arcade, and then ten of us would be watching X two and shit together. Oh um, yeah. But I was never, uh, I never dated really. Like I told you before, I only dated my friends. It right. was like, we've already known each other for years and spent every day with each other. Right. You want to start going steady? You know, <laughs> that, that was my move. Um, never like went up to a stranger like, can I pick you up at eight? I've never done, I've literally uh, never done that. Yeah, no. Uh, but anyway, she's telling him about her dream in this scene. I, I thought this was hilarious. And because it's like. It, it's like a thing in couples, I feel like, where, like, Carissa does this all the time, where she wants to tell me in detail about a dream. 
It's oh, like a real yeah. thing, I think, that happens to everybody probably. Yes. But, and I'm like, I never care because it's not real. You know what I mean? <laughs> the only dreams you find fascinating are your own dreams. And I don't have them. I don't dream. So it's like, it's very rare. If I do, it's like a nightmare kind of thing where something's, I should have handled it while I was awake probably. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought this was really funny because she's going in detail about this wild ass dream, except he's Perry Como, but he doesn't speak English and he's just zoning out. But he says what you can't say, right? And she's like, what's your problem? And he's like, well, it's just like now we're dating and I got to give a shit about what you say. <laughs> and she's so cool yeah, that she's just like, no, no, no. But anyway, with the dream. She's like, there's no strings attached. I just want to tell you about this weird dream I had. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's when he comes up with the idea for the dating game. And he pitches the dating game. Uh, they buy it. They at least give him $7,500 to make a, a pilot. <laughs> I do love the scene where he, they buy it. And he walks outside. And he's like screaming. And Penny comes out. Did they buy it? Yeah. And they're celebrating. And she's like, you want to go celebrate? No, I got a date. She's like, okay, bye. And then yeah. they leave. <laughs> Because she's she's really okay with the polyamorous lifestyle that they're having right yeah. now at this moment, right? Um, and we get another fucking montage already. It's the third one. And this time it's of the dating game taping. Uh, and then he tries to sell it. The dating game to ABC says no. Uh, and they picked a show called Hoot and Nanny. Hoot and fucking Nanny. And then Penny's trying to talk to him while he talks uh, about a dog on the phone. Some lady named Phoebe. I guess it's one of his other that's girlfriends. His, his sister. Oh, it's a sister? Yeah, he says it's a sister. Uh, but does he say that? No, I thought he said it's my sister to the woman on the phone because they can hear Penny. That's the way I took it. No, he's. I, I think he's talking to his sister, Phoebe, oh, because they say later on that, that he, he has, has a sister. He has a younger sister. Your mother raised you as a woman until you had your sister. Yeah. Right. Um, and he finds out Tuvia is in town. Uh, Which is the the... A grown-up version of the young girl he asked to lick it. Yes, but what's fucking weird about this is that he's got a picture of of eight-year-old Tuvia framed in his house. Yes. And Penny's like, oh, your niece? Yeah. Because that's apparently what he told her that that was. Yeah. Yeah, what the fuck is going on here, right? And then uh, he goes to see her, calls him Strawberry Dick Barris, and then she's like, got a baby, and she's like, get the fuck out of here, and just slams the door on him. Because yeah. it's weird that you're here. Yes. Uh, and then George Clooney pops up like a G, because he's George Clooney. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got such a good screen presence, that Cloonster. I does. swear. He should brock that little mustache and he's more from, often. He's from Kentucky. You know, a man Did after you know my he own heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's and a deep cut joke for people. He he runs into, uh, and I think it's purposeful that they did this this way because again, it's like, oh, he really was a spy. Is what the movie's saying. It's like I don't think they are because all of a sudden George Clooney as Jim pops up to offer him a job for the CIA while he's getting his ass beat at a bar after getting denied uh, by Tuvia again. Right, so he's miserable. He feels small in the world. And this makes him feel big to make this up. It's kind of, the, I think, the tack that you can take with it. Um, but yeah. The incel. It's like, hey, you got, you got Moxie, kid. I can teach you 30 different ways to kill a man with a single blow. Uh, really <laughs> weird interaction with him and Sam Rockwell, but funny if you're a big fan of Sam. Uh, and then we cut to a killing a man with bare hands lessons scene. And uh, the, guy, the guy literally crushes the larynx of a guy. Yeah. And he's like, shit, I need another volunteer. <laughs> It's really funny. I will say all of the government training montage stuff or scenes are really fucking funny. A lot of this is like Coen Brothers. Is this supposed to be funny humor that I love? Yeah. A lot of this movie is. Um, by the way, in that scene, there's two guys. It, it was uh, when they're panning across all the trainees. It's um, Lee Harvey Oswald and another <laughs> famous assassin. Uh Basically making the joke that the government tr trained them to kill who they killed. Yeah. Um, they, they probably had Lee Har Harvey Oswald kill JFK. Yeah. Uh, and then w during this sequence, uh, the, one of the, my favorite lines in the movie is, uh, I, I, think, I forget what Chuck says. Something like, I, I, no, I make TV shows. I don't want to kill people. And uh, George Clooney says, Jesus Christ was dead and alive again by 33. You better get cracking. You better get cracking. I love that line. I'm dead you're and alive again by 33. 32 years old and achieved nothing. Jesus Christ died and lived again by 33. You better get cracked. I love that. Yeah. Especially delivered by George Clooney. Uh, I fucked up re re <laughs> I saying do, that. I love how he's like, I know everything about you. I know which hand you jerk off with left. And then <laughs> you see Sam Rockwell like, hold his hand. Yeah. Like, oh my God, he does know. <laughs> yep. Uh, and we get more training and like, you know, marksman training and stuff. And then he invents the newlywed game uh, while learning torture. Uh, like the 
that stupid drill sergeant like puts the electrodes in the balls of the mannequin. <laughs> He's like, yeah, commie. Uh, yeah, the, the, the scene was so like, like there was a nitroglycerin guy. There was the, 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 the hey, Ivan, what's your aunt's recipe for vodka cookies? Yeah. Like they were so turned up as like almost as if this was a game show. And they were like, hey, Johnny, what do we have today? Let's find out what your aunt's vodka cookie recipe is. Like, yeah. I loved how they did that. Yeah, it's it's staged really well. But the whole time he's drawing uh, what a little drawing of uh, the newlywed game. The newlywed game. Yeah. And then he's on a plane with uh, Jim, played by Clooney. They're heading to Mexico City. It's 1964. It's his first kill. He's got to get a man named Rinda. Uh, and he tells him, you don't play, you don't leave, right? Like, because he doesn't want to kill the guy. Uh, and then we cut to basically he killed Rinda. We see Rinda dead and we see Chuck leaving. Uh, and we cut a little bit to present day Chuck still looking like Tom Hanks from Castaway, butt ass naked in his hotel room. With red slippers, though. Mm. Mm. And then he's going on a home on a plane after the Rinda murder uh, cuts to him vomiting in his apartment. Penny shows up. He's got his gun. He's hiding it from her. She says funny shit all the time. Like in this, it's like, Ooh, Montessori's revenge. Did you drink the water down there? You don't want to get Montessori's revenge. Yeah. Do you, you ever think about why it's weird? Our water's clean. There's not, it's coming from the same ocean. Like she's awesome. I'm a hippie now. Yeah, uh, I'm a hippie now. Yay. And he comes out to his living room. She had painted this giant gold bird on the wall. And apparently she was high when gold Goldberg called. Yeah. Larry Goldberg called and her weight, instead of like leaving a note, Larry Goldberg car, called, she paints a actual golden bird on yeah. the wall. <laughs> gold bird called. He's like, what? But basically he wants to rescind his statement before he wants to buy the dating game. Uh, and then he's playing this like raunchy version of it for the executives and they're like we can't fucking air this what are you talking about fix it it's too lewd <laughs> what is your nationality i am my mother's welsh my father's hungarian i guess you could say that makes me well, well hung, hung. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well i, the, the, I the play the trumpet if i blew you what would you sound like <laughs> ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. what's funny the, the guy the, that starts all of this is she's like what would I like most about you? And he just goes, my cock. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even try to like be coy about it or anything. Uh, and then he, so he hires Peter Jenks, a guy who looks like Mike Pence for some reason to like mother <laughs> to like knuckle down and make sure they don't get too lewd on the game show. I love the FCC guy. Yeah. Just how he just gets really into just, you know, it's a federal offense. You will get for, for this penalty for this lewd behavior is one year in prison or ten thousand dollars, and it's a long drive to that prison, baby. Just you and me. Like and he says something about because it's on American. Uh, gives a good speech. So the show is a big that hit. That guy really made a meal out of his monologue. He crushed. Yeah, it was his one chance, man. He wasn't gonna blow it. Mom spaghetti. Uh, the show's a big hit. He gets moved to prime time. Uh, so he's got to make it a little bit hotter. And then Jim shows up to recruit him for a gig again and offers to help out with the show as well. Basically, it, it lines up with his plans for the CIA hitman move to be a chaperone all around the world. Instead of offering to pay them for dinner, you take them somewhere else in the world. Except everywhere that they take them is like <laughs> not a vacation destination. Like Eastern like, Eastern Europe. <laughs> Well, like later on, it says they say West Germany, Berlin, and you can see the girl, like the lady getting real excited, and then realize what he said and get super pissed. Yeah, um, but yeah, this, it goes through some dating game contestants. This is where we get the Brad Pitt and Matt Damon cameo up against this like schmuck guy who happens to be giving good answers, mm -hmm. and so the idea is that the woman chose this dude over Brad Pitt and Matt Damon, which is funny. So the, their prize is to go to Helsinki uh, in 1967. It's snowing. It's cold. And he's asking Chuck for help. Like she, that guy's hilarious, by the way, the whole him like chasing Chuck around without Chuck answering around Helsinki. You got to talk to her, Chuck. You're the chaperone. You're not doing your job very well, Chuck. And then he goes to the bar. He's got like this like code to, to meet his connection there. He picks the wrong lady at first. Helsinki's wonderful this time of year. But the actual agent that he's seeking is Julia Roberts. Uh, and she pops up, uh, you're not like the other murderers. Uh, I, I love that bit where he sees the white shoe and sits down with the wrong person. Yeah. And, and she's she like, yeah, I guess. Doesn't know the passcode. So then he looks further down the booth and sees like, oh, there's another white shoe. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, that's that was, what I mean. Like, I, I really did enjoy the, the, the spy assassin hijinks. Like I thought the, the comedy was really, really good in these scenes. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so then he kills the guy. 
Uh, and he almost kills the contestant because he hates him, but also he might turn around and see that he's there. But luckily for him, he goes away. And how many times are we going to see his ass is what I wrote here. Because again, it's that beautiful, those beautiful cheeks are out and he's using a ridiculous amount of lube to put that tiny microfilm in his booty hole. I just want to say. I'm just saying that's a, it's a nice ass. Uh, but then he runs into Olivia slash Patricia and they make sweet love on the table. But she says, leave the microfilm in, baby. <laughs> Never thought I would ever hear someone say that. It's like a plug. I do love when she goes to swipe the, because she does that thing where they're like, they're so dramatic for each other. Yeah. Dramatically brush everything off the table. She actually ends up like karate chopping the stem of his wine glass off. And oh, yeah. He, and then he just like chucks the, the rest of it behind yeah. him. I That was a good touch. It's cute. Yeah, it's good. Um, <laughs> and they chat before they bang. And she's like, you're cute in a homely sort of way. <laughs> He quotes another playwright. This time it's Nabokov. The first time he quoted, he knew it was Twelfth Night from Shakespeare that she would. So they have this like theater connection there. Um, but then, yeah, then they have sex. When he gets home, uh, he gets in the car and he's really snarky to like his his British connection there who wants Oliver. the microfilm. What is his name? Oliver? Oliver. And he's really rude to him. Like, it's my ass. Once you get it, you know, <laughs> he's like, I think you can show a little appreciation here. And they're like, Patricia Watson was your appreciation. So. The what do you think Patricia was? The the the, the sex was a gift. Uh, and then uh, when he gets back to his network at his job, they go, it's the hit man. And he's like, what? Because he's a guy who makes hit TV shows, right? Uh, that was clever. They do a thing in this scene that they do several times where there is like a giant window or something that is framing the scene. So the foreground is like the color palette is like gray and drab. But what's happening through the window is very colorful Warm. and bright and fun. And they do that several times for the movie. And it's a, it's a nice little stage. We actually stage see a, a real clip, an early clip from, from the newlywed game uh, playing on that TV while they're having the party in the, in the background. Yeah. And <laughs> the host says, uh, all right, ladies, tell what's, me a strange location you once had the desire to, have, to make whoopee. To make whoopee. And the woman says, uh, in my ass? <laughs> And it's kind of an urban legend that this clip happened and it says that it's real if you if you Google it, but it's so mythologized that the host no longer knows if that really happened or not. But there we saw footage of it, right? So it's just, I thought that was interesting because I thought it was strange that it was very kind of explicit for early 70s, especially on TV. You oh, know? yeah. It was like, a, what do they call that? There was laws against that kind of obs the obscenity. The guy. Obscenity yeah. laws, you know? Yeah. Uh, but apparently that really happened that she really thought. And he's like, uh, no, uh, location, like as in uh, <laughs> <laughs> like a beach. And the husband's uh. just laughing like she does like anal. It's, <laughs> oh, boy, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's that mix of that. And also like, I can't believe you said that. Yeah. Oh, everyone knows what we do. <laughs> Uh, and then. Which, you know what? Good for them. They good for them. Have butt sex all you want. Yeah, none of our Get business. It. I love love. Yeah, that's right. All kinds of it. Chuck's driving around with Penny. He buys a house and uh, she's there with him. Penny asks him to marry her. And uh, I didn't understand how she called him over here. She called him Strawberry Dick. Uh, or no, it was Jim that called him Strawberry Dick. Yeah, Jim he, calls, him he calls Jim because he's so depressed. He wants to kill somebody, right? He wants the work to distract him. Uh, and Jim calls him Strawberry Dick because he knows everything about him. And that's when he sends him to West Berlin, Germany. And the woman's upset that that's the prize. Uh, and he's supposed to kill Hans Colbert. And he starts tunneling into East Berlin. Uh, we, he meets up with a fucking Rudger Hauer. That's his connect in Germany. And he like chokes out the the mark and he's like, take a picture. And like, <laughs> I do like that. <laughs> he like poses with him. <laughs> he's like, get the picture. And he's, he does this like smile, like, ee, I'm choking the guy on yeah. skis. He's like <laughs> fixes his hair and stuff. And then the guy who snuck him in through the tunnel is being arrested when he gets back. And he gets cornered by the commies, see? Uh, KGB. Luckily, the KGB needed him to trade for a Russian agent. We really and need you to make Russian version of dating game. It's the, yeah, right. This is what we need you for. It, it's the dating show dork. Uh, was the Russian agent, and that was his hot lady that he was with. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's like, "What really hurt me is that it took seven of us to replace him because he's the only one they're trading for." So the idea is that that schmuck was like an amazing KGB agent. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, and but you know who else would make amazing KGB agents, Chris? Who? 
uh, some of the patrons that keep the lights on Ooh. here on the show. It's time to do June shout outs for the super patrons. These are patrons that are uh, supporting the show at the highest tier. Chris, are you ready to shout them out? Let's do it. Uh, thank you so much to Chester Copperpot, Stanton Valentino, Svento7, Jaron Bowers, Jenny, A.K. Ashley Ray, Alan Tomlinson, Wendy O'Laughlin, Jason Hawkins, Trey Barrera, Conrad, David Malfara, Kaylee Sampson, Rabbit Dog in a Barbie Car, Jose Ruben Cruz Rodriguez, sweet dude, Alexis Adler, Thomas Alexander, Emmy, Joe Velez, Valerie, Aaron Layton, John Collins, Amanda King, Son, Loving Mortal, Andrew Gray, Jadinklage, Morgoon, Jen Robinson, Kate, Chloe Richardson, Kalisha Reeves, Kiki Newton, Kevin Strother, Jeanette Murphy, Casey McCain, and of course, Enza. Enza. If you would like to also support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash streaming things to do so. Thank you so much to all that you to all that do that. And if you can't afford to, that's fine. That's understandable. We understand. Just share the show on social media. Uh, maybe rate and review wherever you're listening to this. That's uh, equally helpful. And we appreciate anything you can do to help support us. Mm-hmm. Or even just by listening. We appreciate that you're here. Absolutely. But yeah, they would make great KGB agents. But there's a mole in the agency is what we realized at this point in the plot. What? A mole. Mole, 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 mole. Cut back to L.A., 1976. Uh, He's fantasizing about shooting the talent auditioner because she's so bad. Uh, And this is where he comes up with the idea for the gong show. The next idea that he has that takes off completely where he's like, wait, the fact that they suck is what people want to see. Which, by the way. Is real. Like even to this day, like the first few episodes of American Idol where everybody's bad are always the ones that like have the most viewers. Yeah. People just love that shit. Yep. And uh, Chuck Barris was starting to become famous from hosting the gong show, something that he never thought would happen. Because the the first there was actually supposed to be a a different host for the gong show. But that host misunderstood the assignment, as it were, Mm -hmm. and thought it was a legit talent show for talented people. And. On, like Ch- um, Chuck Barris supposedly on the fly was like, oh, we they like canned him like immediately. And they're like, who are we going to get to replace him? And the studio was like, well, why don't you do it? You know exactly what the show is. And that's how he became the host of a show. That's what happened. And uh, he runs into this like beautiful woman at this party. And I love how they do this, like at the height of what should be his happiness, right? Like he's got his third successful show. He's now famous. You can tell that he's kind of miserable at it. Uh, at the whole situation of where his life is. And he runs into this beautiful woman who he thinks is impressed by who he is. And she goes to tell Follow him. Follow me into this cave. Yeah. Follow me into the pool cave. I think you are everything that's wrong with this country and this world. You're despicable and, you know, lays into him. He almost falls over from from shock and all and runs away. Um, what have you done for your, uh, to elevate yourself above the masses? Oh, you created the dating game? That's right next to the Sistine Chapel. Mm-mm-mm. Burn. Boom. Again, laying it in. That woman is a cerebral assassin. I want to know her origin story because she fucking knew his weakness from afar, lured him into a cave so there would be no witnesses and struck. And wrecked him. It was impressive. Again, laying into the themes of somebody with this quote unquote success would still not have it fill, uh, be filled up enough, right. With, with their accomplishments in life and would make up a story about being a member of the CIA. Right. Uh, or would be the type of person that would be willing to do it. Who knows what they're trying to say? Yeah. Like I'm not just a TV show host. I'm helping America. Damn it. Yeah. I'm patriot taking care, care of America's enemies. And then Keeler, his buddy, Rudger Hauer, his buddy from Germany, uh, killed his contact and reached out to him. So he's like, he's convinced that he's there to kill him. He meets up with him. Uh, and they just have a good talk about being lonely assassins, actually, in fact. Someone killed Oliver. <sighs> so sad. So sad. That was actually really well done. That scene where you saw Oliver's death, it like the lights went out and you like it was, but it was like in a gun flash way. Yeah. And then it's just him. I don't know. I can't describe it, but it was fucking really well done. Yeah. It was very effective. Um, and then, and then we see Chuck with a prostitute on his birthday. That's how lonely of a guy he is. Happy birthday. Not like a Marilyn Monroe me. Kennedy way. He's like paying someone to sing happy birthday to him. Uh, Because he, I guess part of his relationship with his mother makes that happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's (laughs) what a weird thing to add, like an hour and 15 minutes into this movie. (laughs) Yeah. That's the the part where George Clooney was like, I had to change some things, man. And like, this is the best I could do with it. I bet. Uh, But back in LA, 1979, Keeler committed suicide, supposedly. Right. Uh, and then Patricia shows up, played by Julia Roberts, uh, and, and Penny gets upset about Patricia. She's starting to get impatient with this uh, non-committal lifestyle their relationship has. Rutger Hauer had a really good line. Um, the last time you see him, he says something like- Something about you, tears in the rain. 
I've seen things you people wouldn't imagine. <laughs> uh, no, he was he, he was kind of saying like, why do we do what we do? You know, when the first time we killed somebody, it was thrilling. Uh, but when you kill someone, you become their sadness and you live a different life. So he's like all the, I think the weight of everything's on that guy, but it's also crashing down on Chuck as well, being a quote unquote assassin. It's kind of like when you drink unicorn blood in the Forbidden Forest, you know, it gives yeah. you uh, immortality, but it takes a chunk of your soul. Yeah. And is, is the price worth it? I'd say not. Mm. Unless you've already created six or seven Horcruxes yeah. and you got nothing to lose. Yeah. <laughs> but what's going to stop you? But I digress. Get that unicorn's blood. I'm just saying it's the same thing. Uh, and then Penny gets upset that Patricia's there. Again, she's getting impatient. And we get another montage. This time it's with uh, it's with happiness with Penny mixed with like killing people alongside Patricia, uh, all to an off-key Elvis impersonator. From the gong show, yeah. Uh, and then Keeler was murdered, it turns out. That's what he's saying. And... Uh, Right after that, all of his shows get canceled. The guy comes from the studio, comes to cancel his shows. Says, "Don't, don't shoot me, Chuck. I'm just the messenger." I really love the scene where Sam Rockwell pulls out the little finger gun. Yeah, like there's something. The way he delivers that action is like very scary. Like, ooh, yeah, he is kind of haunting. But then the guy goes, "Blah." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they undercut to cut it the tension. with tension. Yeah, and it's a very good example of like undercutting tension with comedy, but in a very good way. Yeah, yeah. It's like moments over. We're moving on. Yeah, it was great. Uh, you, have you seen? You've seen Seven Psychopaths, right? No. You fucking have to watch it. It's um, it's a uh, Martin McDonough film. The guy who did Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Yeah, it's, it's uh, in Bruges. A couple years old, right? Yeah, I mean, from I'm, like 2016, 2017 I, I probably. I remember you doing a Crossing Streams on it. I fucking love that movie, but it's got this version of Sam Rockwell and it's great. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Chuck is with another woman when Penny shows up and it's a heartbreaking scene because she came all excited to tell him she sold a painting uh, and she's like, this is our house. And he's like, this is my house, Penny. He's like, no, I bought this with you. I decorated it with you. We celebrate it together. It's one thing to go out and look for Pooh Nanny. But like this is our thing, like it's our place. I've asked you to marry me the twenty times. I'm, I'm loyal to you in my own way. Like all I ask are very simple things. You can't seem to even muster the courage to follow those rules, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I thought it was a pretty sad scene. I love that they film him backlit, like you don't actually see his face yeah. when she's talking to him. He's ashamed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Penny and Chuck are talking and crying in the next scene, um, in a long scene. Um, kind of, kind of commiserating in their own weird way. When we cut to Jim, he, he tells her that he loves her in his own way, but not the head over heels romantic not way. Not romantic way. What right. is romantic love? Isn't that an illusion? But what she takes out of that is, you just said you love me. Yeah, which is a little heartbreaking because like, very heartbreaking. Did he? But also, he's incapable of love yeah. in that way. Yeah. Um, which I think is evidenced uh, by the death of Patricia. But we cut. I don't. I didn't understand this scene. I think I did, but I'm not sure. We see Jim sitting on Chuck's diving board in his pool. He's got a gun. Uh, uh, Chuck comes out with a gun. He says, I need you to find the mole and take him out. And he's like, I'm not going to kill anybody. I'm out, right? He points a gun at him. He's like, you don't, you kill him. And he's like, I, I don't fit the profile. And uh, and he's like, well, there is no profile. And he's like, oh, is, is there not? Uh, you know, you're a douchebag, lonely guy. <laughs> yeah. Your mom uh, raised you as a woman for the first couple of years. You killed your twin sister in the womb. Yeah, that was your first hit. That was your first hit. Your dad's not really your dad. Your real dad's a dude who's a serial killer. Yeah, serial killer dad. Um, and he's like, what? what are you talking about, right? So that's the profile. But there's a bunch of blood in the pool. It, did did Jim die here? Had he been hit by the mole or whatever? Because he's like, yeah, you're it, a smart guy. You'll it, figure it out. And that's why he had the gun out, I think, is that he had some kind of firefight. Yeah, I think out of the... In the moment, I was a little confused, but in context, I think he went to kill uh, Chuck because he thought Chuck was the mole, and then Patricia took him out. I guess they fought there, and so he just kind of like sat on the diving board and just kind of waited to die or something. I, I think don't he know. just wounded walked to Chuck's or wounded went to Chuck's is oh, what I yeah. think. Okay, that yeah, that and makes like, more sense. He was like, I'm going to die. I lost. I need you to find the mole. Uh, I don't fit the profile anymore. I guess. The profile is a living person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we cut to Chuck driving. I love this. He's paranoid. You do see a car turning every time he turns in the in the, in the the rear view, uh, the rear window. So it's like, oh, is he being followed, right? Um, and there's another fucking montage. <laughs> uh, and then he like loses it completely. He pulls a gun on the, the 
the paper un- bag on the, the head guy. The unknown comic, which is that, was, that's the, a real the, thing. I'm guessing. Yeah, the unknown comic is like a ongoing bit on the Gong Show. Gong Show. Interesting. As long as Gene Gene the Dancing Machine. <laughs> and uh, he starts losing it on stage. Right, he's just completely batshit. Um, he makes an apology to Penny. Uh, and then he finished his book, did, so it cuts to... Go ahead. Did we talk about the, the weird flashback to him as a baby with his mom? Do we have to? I, it's, I don't know, it's such a weird <laughs> thing to like add and throw in there. It's like this version of his mom, terrified. Uh, I think it's kind of an emasculating thing, like, oh, you big, bad, scary CIA serial killer man. Your main problem is you actually just have mommy issues. Mm-hmm. And that's why you're like horribly abusive to women and then why you murder people. Yeah, because I, she, I she raised him as a, as a girl until... Uh, his younger sister was, was born. born. And then I guess every time he had a birthday, she would sing him happy birthday, but wearing funeral clothes because she's really mourning the loss of the 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 baby girl that should have been his twin. Yeah, I guess so. So like his, he feels bad about having a he's, birthday. He's, yeah, he's been, never been wanted or whatever. Yeah, it, it's just, uh, yeah, it's a very strange thing to add this late into the movie. <laughs> I guess so, but you're kind of like, hey, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, he apologizes to Penny. I do like the scene in the present where suddenly he like shaves, he dresses and finally and shaves the whole castaway persona because he's finished with his book now. And that's why he was in that dungeon. Yeah. And um, like you said, he wrote that note to Penny saying she was the best part of his life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then he goes to see Patricia and we get this cool like noir ending to the movie kind of right. Like, um. He tells her, I hate myself for how I lived. And there's another great line where she, qu- I think it's so fucking funny. I laughed more than anyone else is going to laugh. I will acknowledge that. But she's like, well, she quotes Nietzsche and she says, what's well, like Nietzsche says, uh, the man who despises oneself uh, at least respects oneself for despising. And he's like, yeah, that's true. I can't even despise myself with any insight. And I just fucking from Sam Rockwell, I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, um, I do like how after that he goes like, "I'm a lesser person. I wanted to be a writer, but I'm disposable. I wanted to write things that lesser people would quote, but he never got. He doesn't feel like he's that way. He's disposable. I know. Yeah, he says I disposed of people, but I'm disposable. Yeah, um, and I wanted to write words that lesser people would quote, but I am a lesser person. Yeah, because he's always quoting Carlisle and all these other people all throughout the yeah. movie. Yeah, and I identify with that. Mm-hmm. I quote people a lot. I want to write things people quote. And instead, I get it. I'm not a killer. Hey. But don't push me. <laughs> you didn't expect me to quote Tupac there. No, did I didn't. I was, I was about to quote <laughs> Kanye, so. Oh, that's, I did way better then. As Kanye says, <laughs> my life is dope because I do dope shit. That is a good quote. Mm-hmm. That is a good quote. My life's dope and I do dope shit. Uh, she tries to poison him, but he got her. He switched. I didn't understand when they walked us back through the switcherooski. I was confused. So, I would have died because so, I was confused. Her, she has an indicator to let her know which tea is good for her. The sugar cube is the safe one, right? Right. So what happens is she sets it down. He changes the indicator to his cup, which is poison. And then she switches it, I think, because she's like in case like he. So he double switched it to where when she switched it back, it was still the poison one, right? She switched the indicator. So she switched it away to where. You're not explaining this in a helpful way. (laughs) Okay. So her cup of coffee has the the little sugar man to on the side, right? Yes. His cup of coffee does not. Correct. He switches the sugar man to his cup of coffee, meaning that, so in her mind, that cup of coffee is clean when it is not. But he also turns it and turns the creamer. He doesn't. And then he she d- turns he, it and turns the creamer he back. He doesn't turn the coffees. He turns the he, creamer he, in the middle. He turns the creamer and he turns the, the indicator. So the cups don't change. Uh-huh. So when she sees that that, the cup that she needs to drink is away from her. She turns it back to her so that she can drink it. Oh, I get but it. it. But it's actually the poison cup because she, she thought she was switching it back when in fact she was switching it the first right. time. I yeah. gotcha. Yeah. You did it. God damn it. I did it. <laughs> um, I will say I watched the scene three times. Okay. <laughs> to make like, what is happening? Oh, okay. I get it now. Yeah, it's clever. <laughs> so I'm not that smart. I don't want you to think like I had it figured out on a first watch. It took me like a couple of rewinding. Like what? But he got her and she dies. She's shocked. And he writes a little suicide note for her that says no love, no love, um, which was really his note. Right. I think is the way you're supposed to take it. Better if she wrote no scrubs. And then he ends up he marries Penny. But in fact, that's not what happened. Well, there was no Penny. He did marry someone a bunch of times. Um, 
But yeah, whether or not you believe Chuck Barris killed 33 people or was just a, a, a maker of popular and terrible TV shows, that's up for you to decide, mm -hmm. baby. And then at the very end, we get to see footage of the actual Chuck Barris. They filmed him mm -hmm. at the very, very end. And there's a monologue where he says, I have a new game. It's called The Old Game. It's <laughs> three old guys with loaded guns on stage. They look back in their lives to see what they were, how close they came to their dreams. And the winner is the one who doesn't blow his brains out. He gets a refrigerator. I, I loved that ending. Yeah, because there's great. There's this joke that he can like he can pit people who are in love with each against each other just for the opportunity to get a lawnmower, a refrigerator, or one of those appliances they always sent people home with on those shows. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that was the end of Dark Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Dark ending, but also uh, apropos. Uh, thank you, uh, Ghost, for asking Ghost. me to watch this movie. Um, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Charlie Kaufman. I do like George Clooney quite a lot. Uh, Michael Clayton. Woo woo. Great movie. Michael Clayton. Uh, Michael Clayton fucking slaps, boy. Don't you laugh. And uh, <laughs> this was like a, a blind spot for me completely. It wasn't even on my watch list. So I'm really, really glad that you asked me to watch this. I had a good time. Like I said, it's not perfect. I think the, the competing creative minds of George Clooney and uh, Charlie Kaufman maybe don't mesh great together, but you throw Drew Barrymore and, and Sam Rockwell in there and you have something that was really fun to watch. There is a lot to love in this movie. Mm -hmm. That's what I have to say about it. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. So tune in for more stuff later this week and we got more lost, uh, coming soon. All kinds of good stuff around the corner. I appreciate all of you for joining us on this new, uh, what is it called? New era of streaming. New things. era. Five days a week, man. This yeah. is day three of five. Tomorrow you're getting lost. Friday you're getting Star Trek Strange New Worlds with my best friend, Phil. Dead ass. No cap. No cap. Mm -mm. Thank you for, for tuning in. That's no all love. the time we have for right now. My name is Chris. And I'm Steve. And this is Streaming Things. Happy streaming. Happy streaming.